I don't know if you you know what a paradigm is or a paradigm shift, but I'm I'm here to explain that to you if you if you want to know. Well, we covered it briefly on um, at the end of the last call. We did, and uh, yeah, so I, I understand. It's just a piece of information or a lesson that you learn which allows you to look at things in completely different ways yeah i think that's pretty much it um i looked it up on the dictionary um and i looked up well a paradigm uh, is different from a paradigm shift so i guess we need to know what a paradigm is and a paradigm is uh, uh but basically a paradigm is uh, a way of looking at it it's a sort of um uh, it says here a, a typical example or pattern of something, a pattern or model, uh, or a world view underlining theories and methodology of a particular scientific subject, a set of linguistic um, items that form mutually exclusive choices in particular uh, syntactic roles, um, and so on and so forth. So it's, it's that kind of thing. But in the context that I want to, you know, I, I, I I think of it as being sort of a general thing and it's a paradigm is a, is a way, as you said, of looking at the world or looking at a particular subject, if you like, um, in a particular way. And a paradigm shift is when something happens um, which changes that perspective and almost opens your world up in a way that until that point you, you know, you couldn't have imagined. So um, the dictionary says, a paradigm shift is a fundamental change in approach or underlining assumptions. Um, so there you go. That's what it is. Um, and it's around us everywhere. And it, to me, is the most fantastic of all things. And it's the thing that I wake up in the morning wishing that this will happen to me. You know, um, if, you, if you won the lottery, you know, suddenly your world would be, you know, you'd have a lot more capabilities a lot more possibilities are open to you and a lot of the problems financially that you may currently have uh you know you might be able to write those off uh, winning the lottery would give you a completely new lease of life in terms of what you could achieve but it wouldn't really be a paradigm shift because you're not learning anything new you've been given more possibilities but you've not learned anything new um so much as i'd love to win the lottery i would much prefer to have a paradigm shift. So, I know that you you love your you know you love reading, uh, well, listening to audiobooks and learning things, don't you, Tom? Mm -hmm. So, really, I guess what you're looking for uh, in anything that you that you listen to in your audiobooks is you're looking to have a paradigm shift occur to you on a personal level. You're looking for a bit of information that's going to rock your world, going to change your world forever, and open your your mind to, to see something clearly for the first time that you, you never could have imagined before. Mm. I think um, I might be wrong. Uh, it's good to talk about it, I suppose. Uh, mm. And I was thinking that the, it's easier to have paradigm shifts where you don't, where you know little. So yeah, as you, I mean, I, I suppose if you're just going to say dif difficulty, it's if you don't know much, then you can have mm. many more paradigm shifts than if you know a lot. Um, uh, I had a one recently, mm. which I, I wouldn't probably refer to it as a paradigm shift, but it was, um, it's an interesting one. Uh, and it was, I'd like to hear about yours as well, if you, if mm. you've got them. Uh, but my most recent one, which might qualify as a, as a paradigm shift was, um, a piece of information, uh, which said that you should, it's sort of referred to as, um, taking the path of most resistance. Um, okay. sometimes the question is, uh, what are you, re what are you resisting? So mm. e everything that you think, I'm not really too sure I want to do that or yeah. uh, I'm, I'm afraid of that or something. That's what you have to do. Mm. So it is a, it's sort of like a, I don't know, like a life philosophy yeah. that you just decide that not, um, kind of like, I don't want to do the ho hoovering, so I have to do the hoovering. But like mm. the things which you, which you're resisting, tell you what how you should proceed. They tell you that you need to go do that thing, that and that's sense. where all the growth. That's how you'll grow as a human being. You're, you're is, probably right. I've I've got some examples um, 
of paradigm shifts that sort of happened on a sort of global level um, that happened sort of reasonably recently. Um, and, and very often they come from, well, they always come from, they, in a way, they always come as a surprise. So the Wright brothers, uh, they wanted to build a flying machine and everyone laughed them. Ha ha, they laughed and laughed and laughed. You, mankind can never fly. You're just a bunch of idiots. Um, and then at some point, somebody probably looked up from a field and saw this flying machine flying past with the Marx Brothers in it. And, um, and it wasn't a paradigm shift from the Marx Brothers. See, they already had kind of got their head around the fact that it's possible to fly. They had a theory and they were, you know, testing it. So they were scientists in a way in that regard. Um, but to some guy who might have been just working in the field, who had never ever imagined the possibility of being able, human beings being able to fly well to him when he looked up and he saw that flying machine go past even if it was just for a few hundred meters um that was a paradigm shift suddenly this man had woken up to the to the understanding that flight is possible after all and and this gets your mind working in a completely different way a, a, a paradigm shift um that everyone knows about is that another one is um the breaking of the Enigma code, that's a brilliant one. Um, Alan Turing was one of the people working um, in the UK at the time of the Second World War trying to, to crack the Enigma code. The Enigma code was uh, the, the most deviously clever code system that had ever been invented at the time uh, by the Germans so that they could uh, communicate with their, their armed forces um, in the Second World War without the Allies knowing what was going on. Um, and so, you know, all of the allies and all of the Germans, everybody had teams of code breakers, but the Germans had invented this incredible machine that was uncrackable, it was unsolvable. And the reason was because there were so many thousand millions of computations that had to be made that, um, that it was impossible to, to crack these before midnight. And at midnight every night, the Germans would change the code uh, and then if you cracked it at one minute to midnight, you will, yay, celebration, but it was worthless then because a minute later it gets changed. So the idea would be to crack the code as early as possible in the day and then be able to listen in and know what the Germans were doing throughout the day. So Alan Turing came up with a bit of a, a radical idea, which was to create a machine because it was too slow to do the human computations. And he had teams of mostly women sitting there um, trying to break the code, pretending to be some, doing something else in case the German spies were around. Um, and what it was, was, you know, sometimes they'd crack it a bit earlier and sometimes they, they wouldn't crack it at all. And every day they'd have to reset it and start again from scratch. So he came up with this machine and there was a lot of people saying no. Is there a film um, based on this? It, there is a film based on it. Um, me, basically, it? Lo the long and short of it is the machine um, enabled the the computations to work quicker, but that wasn't enough because it still wasn't quick enough. And then, you know, in a moment of not thinking about it at all, something else that had literally nothing to do with the subject of cracking the code um, came into Alan Turing's mind and it, it made him think, hang on a minute. In other words, thinking outside the box, lateral thinking. And that he added together with a problem in his mind, which was trying to, to crack the code. And it turns out that, um, as in the film, I don't want to uh, give, give away the ending or anything, but um, yes, the, the idea was that some people use the same figures of speech every day. Um, human beings um, have manners of speaking, and so they cracked that, and that enabled them to, to get ahead and break the code. And, the allies there and then they knew they could crack the code every single day and they knew exactly what the germans were doing so that was a fantastic example of something which spawned something else because that machine was the first machine that turned into a computer and it was the sort of the, the first modern step uh, to, to, to sort of taking us down the road where we are now where we're talking on the internet so you know until that point the people there hadn't seen a machine like this. They'd never come across a computer. And Alan Turing invented a computer um, for a specific purpose. And then that computer then went off um, because that having the machine there essentially was a paradigm shift. It took us from one step um, of understanding into a completely new stage. 
um, where, you know, without first creating that first computer and understanding what that was, we'd never have been able to get to the point where we are now. So that was a huge and important paradigm shift. Uh, I briefly talked about another one, which was uh, about, uh, you know, putting the, the, the sun at the center of the solar system. Um, but there are so many others. There are so many others. And almost all of them come about through lateral thinking. Because so what, uh, what, about, what about your paradigm shifts? Uh, my paradigm shifts, um, you know, there are many. One of them is actually learning a foreign language, learning Spanish. Because a language is, uh, it, it kind of acts as a barrier. Language is, is both a way of communication. And so it it's enable, enables you to communicate with other people. Um, which is a fantastic thing because the more people you communicate with, the more you learn about people, the more you learn about the world, and the richer your environment becomes and the more opportunities you get. So that's a great, great thing just in its own right. But everyone kind of realizes that. But what I didn't realize is that it's also a barrier. It sort of acts as a big wall and it stops the flow of communication between different language groups. So if you have two people and they, they stand together and they meet each other and they can't speak with each other, they can't share these ideas. They can't have that human contact. So learning Spanish was almost like opening a third eye onto the world, having another, you know, it, instead of being walking around with, with one eye, imagine you see the room with just the one eye. It's being able to see the room now with two eyes. Um, and with two eyes, you can see 3D. So learning another language was opening myself up to uh, a huge plethora of, of cultural, um, sort of not just cultural reference points and things like this, but also just the way that people, I mean, a language um, sort of makes the Spanish people sort of think within that language and the English people think within the English language. And sometimes the things aren't aligned. I heard that um, about 50% of the world's languages uh, only have three words for color. Um, they have light, dark, and gru, which is a cross between blue and green. Um, so I don't know how that would work for you, Tom, seeing as your name's green. <laughs> you wouldn't exist in these languages, in half the world's languages. Um, <laughs> so just, so, just to reiterate that point, half of the languages in the world yeah. only have three words for color so they don't have a color for say red or something There's they no don't, they don't need it they don't need it so they don't have it yeah and so this is this is um uh you, you can imagine that people who have come from that culture um you know to, to come up with different different colors for different things it's 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 almost like a wow moment to them, you know? It's this incredible wow moment where they, they have a paradigm shift. I didn't realize it was possible to be that descriptive about, about different colors. But you can take it further because, you know, if you go to the local paint shop, you'll find that there are thousands of different sort of words or combinations of words for, for, uh, for different things, such as, um, you know, uh, Arctic blue and, and, you know, I don't know, <laughs> hilltop green or whatever they want to call it and um you know so so you can take it further but it, it it blew my mind that that's the case that you know half the world's languages only have light dark and grew which is i, I have no idea um so these are things that are trapped within language and the, and another thing is um i came across a uh, a TED Talk things. I can't say enough about TED Talks. They're brilliant, especially if you like paradigm shifts. There's some amazing ideas. There was one talk in particular, uh, which I watched recently or listened to, um, and it was about the next hundred years of your life. And I thought, that's an absurd thing. I'm not going to live another hundred years. I'm not going to live a hundred years in total. So I thought, that's hooked me. I'm going to have to watch that. And, and it was this guy talking about the advances. And his job was to to basically, I can't exactly remember, it's an extremely complicated job, but his job was to sort of create or envisage future technology. Um, and he said, the things that he's talking about now, um, things are, you know, increasing at um, in an exponential rate. So he says, 
you know, you have to stop thinking about things, the future in terms of the past. So imagine the whole of past of human technology and all of our culture is in one person to the age of 40. And now you're 40 years old and everything has happened until then. Well, you know, you weren't learning to read and write until you're, you know, about 30, mid 30s. Things have really suddenly speeded up. You know, if, if your day was uh, 24 hours and, and you know, at, at, I don't know, at, uh, at one minute to midnight is where we are now, then it's the exponential growth. So we're going to have, you know, in the next minute, they're going to have a double of the, you know, the, the power in computing and the, the double the knowledge. And there's all sorts of things going on. And some of the things that he was talking about that might be possible, like, um, you know, in 100 years time, the potential to, to change your genes um, at will. Um, you know, I don't want to have blue eyes today. I'll have purple eyes. Things like this, which may well be possible. Um, these are kind of paradigm shifts because, you know, we've always thought of human being being, well, human nature is essentially something that's evolved over a very, very long period of time. And so, you know, a thousand years ago, a human being was pretty similar to a human being today. But that may well not be the case going forward. And, and you know, there may be a, a million different paradigm shifts happening in succession uh, and major international ones. Um, um, another minor one, one that's on a personal level for me, was one that um, that came to me when I asked you what book you were reading. And, uh, you know, you passed me in the office all those years ago, and I said, Tom, what book are you reading? And it was, you know, it, it could have been nothing. You might not have answered me, but you told me it was The Richest Man in Babylon. That would have been a bit rude. <laughs> yeah, it would have been a bit rude, but, you know, you never know. You might have been in a rush. But you said it's The Richest Man in Babylon, and I said, oh, what's that about then? And then you proceeded to tell me, you know, and, you, and the words you used hooked me. And I said, oh, I, want to, I want to read that. And the words were, it's a book about how if you follow a certain, um, what did you say? You can probably remember exactly what you said. But uh, it was words to the effect of, if you, if you follow um, a certain sort of protocol or a certain um, set of steps that you will become rich eventually. And I thought, so it's, it, it's basically a blueprint on how to become wealthy. And you said, yeah. So I said, ah, oh, I'll borrow that after you if that's all right. <laughs> and I read the book and it blew my mind. It really, I thought, I'm going to try this. I'm going to save my 10% of my salary every month. And uh, this is going to change my world. And, um, and I did it and it has changed my world. You know, I, it really has. It's made me... Um, well, for a start, I could never save any money. It was impossible for me to save money. Um, I'd see people on TV saying, that, oh, you should save money now and pay off debt and things like this because it's, you know, it's a good time to do it with low interest rates. It's not a good time to save money with low interest rates, but certainly a good night, time to pay off debts and stuff. And I said, I can't pay off my debts. I haven't got any surplus income. And, um, and having read that book, I thought, you know, I'm going to do what they suggest and I'm going to put 10, I, I opened a, another bank account and I automatically transferred, I set up a direct debit or a standing order to myself to the other bank account and 10% of my income went into there. And the first month was, a, was fine. It was absolutely easy. I didn't even notice the money had gone. The second month was a real struggle. And I thought, oh my God, how am I going to cope? I, you know, I, I always got to the end of the month with enough money in my accounts. I'd never got really, really worried. I wasn't of these people who, you know, was, had no money for the last week of the, of the month or anything. I always had enough money. And suddenly I found myself struggling towards the end of the month. And I thought, well, there's two options. And one of them is to stop doing the 10% thing and go back to how I was. Or the other one is to sort of try and see if I can save some money somewhere. So that's what I did. I went through my accounts and I, uh, I changed. Uh, I, I changed. I realized that I, I could... Um, you know, I could save a bit of money on my insurance here. I could um, do a bank, a bank transfer and send some of my bank, uh, my uh, my credit card debt to another credit card company and save on the interest there. And I, I can, I can, um, you know, you I can uh, switch to a different energy supplier and stuff like this. And I was amazed to discover that by doing these, I'd saved more than ten percent of my income every month. 
So within two months, I'd saved 10% of my income for two months in a row, and I'd reduced my expenditure by more than 10%. So I was actually financially better off um, anyway. And, and it, it was incredible. And then after a while, I found that I had a, a reasonable bit of money um, building up in that other account. And it got to the point where I thought, well, what am I going to do with this money now? <laughs> so back to the book it was. And um, you need to look for good investments. So then I started speaking with you again. And our friendship sort of blossomed at that point, um, which was you know, another fantastic thing that came from that. Um, and we went on this, you and I, we both did, we called it the mastermind, uh, didn't we? We, went, we? we used to walk back after, after work every day and we'd throw ideas at each other that we'd been listening to and that we'd come across. Um, and a lot of it was economically based because uh, that was kind of what we were learning at the time. And a lot of it was marketing based as well. And um, it, was, it was a brilliant time where I think, you know, so many ideas, I, I just did so much learning and I shifted paradigms left, right and center. Um, and it's got us to the point today, uh, Tom, where we were able to leave that job uh, and set up our own business and, you know, uh, and, in, and do other investments as well. So this was a huge and important paradigm shift for me. Uh, I don't know about you, but that was a real big one for me. Yeah, it was. Uh, there's, it's not just that principle either in that book. There's lots and lots mm -hmm. of different things. Um, there was, I mean, we could actually do a, uh, because it's actually in the public domain, we could do a little, read a few passages on the next episode mm -hmm. or something if you want. Yeah, we should. Uh, unless you had something in mind, we could maybe pick um, a couple of paragraphs that we like each and we could yeah. read some from it because... Um, I was going to go into some of the other powerful things, but because they're um, stories, it's actually quite, it's yeah. better to read them as stories than it is just as yeah. but, Totally. But, um, but yeah, yeah, I, that, I don't agree with what you're saying. That, see, this was on a personal level and it did, it, it changed the fundamental way that I look at life and it made me into a more rounded human being with a better understanding. And, and I got really into um, all sorts of things. You gave me another book as well which was uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People by, by Dale Carnegie, um, which I, which I, I never read, <laughs> but I, I was inspired to get it as an audio book because you actually also inspired me to, uh, uh, to get audio books. This, this is turning into a bit of a sort of Thomas Green inspirational story here, but um, <laughs> uh, yeah, you, you, did, uh, you inspired me to get into audio books, um, which means that you can, you can do two tasks at the same time. Um, so I painted my house while listening to an audiobook, and rather than be a horrific chore, um, I couldn't wait every day to get back from work so I could start painting and listen to the next exciting chapter. Uh, and that book, by the way, um, was Shogun uh, by James Clavell, which is an absolute roller coaster of a, of a book. Um, I said in the past, and it probably has lots of Godzilla inks or, or whatever the word was, <laughs> I forget, but. Um, what was it again? Godzilla. Godzinka. God. <laughs> I love that. I love your uh, interpretations of the word of the day and how quickly <laughs> we both forget them. It's uh, Gadzukery. Gadzukery. It's full of Gadzukery and so it should be. It's fantastic. I think I, we should just use, start using that word in just um, the wrong context. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'm feeling really Gadzukery today. <laughs> Um, I don't even know whether that makes sense. That, that's not. a Gadzukri, isn't it? Far yeah. out, dude. Groovy. You know, these are sort of yeah. terminology that we used in the past. But um, yeah, so so that that was that was great. Um, some real big paradigm shifts that have happened. Could you imagine, for example, we're sitting here talking, we look out the window, and a massive flying saucer comes down outside, and out pop a bunch of aliens. Um, and they say, hey, guys, we thought it was about time to welcome you to the universe. There is a whole universe out there. Um, and uh, look, at, we'll give you all this technology. You can do whatever you want now. It's fantastic. Bosh. That would be the mother of all paradigm shifts, you know? That would be extraordinary. Um, and yet that, that same paradigm shift that would affect the entire world, suddenly we're no longer asking whether we're alone or not. Um, suddenly we're no longer asking about sort of what what is dark matter and you know what, what's the meaning of the universe you know some alien comes along and gives us all the answers 
that's that's the biggest paradigm shift of them all you know suddenly he says you know you don't have to get old and die um here's the answer <sighs> you know that that would that's kind of where we're going um I, I came across one in a ted talks the other day which was something that they're trying to achieve and they they some people believe we're very very close to it it's called the master algorithm and effectively it's a it's a sort of ai so artificial intelligence also going back to alan turing who invented that first uh computer to break the um the enigma code alan turing um there's the prize the very famous prize alan turing prize for the first person who could um trick people into to thinking that they were talking to another human when in fact they were actually talking to a computer and this is all about artificial intelligence and that, that's been for many years one of the most important prizes and i think we're pretty much past that now from what i can tell um but the 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 master algorithm is essentially an algorithm which self self learns so it gets to a certain point where it can now just take everything to the next level do you know what i mean i don't know if i'm explaining it very well but it's an algorithm which is so clever it's just, it, it that it can sort of combine all of the knowledge and then use that knowledge to make itself more intelligent and then use that extra level of intelligence to make itself even more intelligent to the point where it knows everything and it can predict everything um so it would be able to say well the prediction of the winning the lottery uh, i would choose these numbers and and it would be pretty much guaranteed to be correct and the weather forecast in 5211 years will be this because of all of these millions of factors and this is what the master algorithm ultimately could achieve um but obviously we're not there yet but there will come a point when ai or whatever it is will suddenly wake up to to understanding something which will just be able to take us to the very next level you know it will enable us to fly like the marx brothers rather than walk around it will enable us to drive a car rather than rely on horses um i heard know, one thing I, about the uh, ai and its ability to learn which hmm. kind of stayed with me and that was um it uh, with ai it's, it's like a computer so you can program it to um learn at a particular pace so um, yeah. at some stage we're going to be able to um either i don't know it will learn on its own or we're going to be able to program it one of the two um mm. to learn um you know thousand thousand times or many many thousand times quicker than what we would be able to so yeah. the example given was um you know in a week's time over that week period the ai would be able to learn the equivalent of a thousand years of learning for us yeah. so the and the basically the, the information that the the ai is going to be able to glean from that is just ridiculous it's, you know yeah. can you imagine the amount you could learn in a thousand years if you had well, access it's to take, all the information it's, yeah it's just going to shoot off into the stratosphere isn't it it's yeah. going to be like a rocket so yeah so it takes us from yeah from all of the knowledge we got that's why that guy in ted talks was talking about you know what our life will be like over the next 100 years where you and i we don't know we, you know a comet might land on us uh, uh, there's a, a chinese there's a chinese space station currently careering out of control um and could very well hit spain and i am in spain so you know it's um that, that might put an end to my life who knows extraordinarily unlikely but you never know what's going to happen um earthquake meteorite heart attack there's a myriad of different things um but assuming none of those things happen then he's suggesting that you know in theory we could become immortal within 100 years because you know if we figure out everything about the dna i mean there are so many parts of the human body that we don't know i think you know especially the female body <laughs> it turns out that um you know people didn't even know what a clitoris looked like didn't know I was going to use that word today but they didn't even know what a clitoris looked like until relatively recently until just you know a couple of decades ago um so you know we don't even know very much about the human body but once the genome is fully fully mapped and truly understood then com you know computer technology can 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 do what it wants i mean can we 
change our code. If we have an accident, can we just grow another arm like a lizard might grow a tail? It seems perfectly reasonable to me that if you have the, uh, the understanding, then these things are possible. Um, but, you know, can you change your personality because you don't, you know, you don't feel that, you know, you don't fancy getting angry today or you want to be happy today or whatever. Can you just go, yeah, I'm just going to think myself. And, and that's the other thing. You, you don't have to use your body to do anything. You don't have to type on the computer. You don't have to, you know, after stopping to type on the computer, we might do everything verbally. Uh, and then finally, you might just think it. And these are things that, and then finally, after that, you don't even have to think it because just as you're coming up with the idea of thinking it, um, this AI technology that's sort of somehow uh, meshed into you um, automatically knows what you want just as you realize you want it. So it anticipates your needs and desires on absolutely everything. And you just have everything where, where and when you need it. I mean, it's extraordinary. Um, but I think possibly the biggest one or one of the very biggest um, paradigm shifts that's ever happened um, was the understanding how understanding how to to use fire and that's a classic example we were literally in the dark um, at night and of, of all animals we are the only one that figured out how to use fire and control it and that without that uh, the rest of it just simply wouldn't have happened you know we're, we're not very strong we're not very fast um, but you know we could use fire we could heat ourselves we could defend ourselves using fire, we could cook with it. Um, I mean, I think that's one of the biggest paradigm shifts. And imagine you were a caveman and then another caveman walks up and he's, he's carrying a, a burning torch, you know? Imagine what, what that means to you, you know? It's like, whoa. And imagine what that guy with a burning torch can achieve in comparison to you, you know? Oh, you are walking into a cave and there's a bear there. Well, which one's gonna be safer? Which one's going to survive? It's more than likely going to be the guy with bear, the torch. The bear will be safer, definitely. Yeah, that's true. The bear will definitely be safer. <laughs> um, but, you know, this is a huge paradigm shift. Um, the, with the alien things, there's things like that have happened all the time. I, uh, I remember seeing a documentary on TV years ago, and it was a filmed first encounter. Um, there was essentially what was happening is in Amazonia, in... in um, uh, in Brazil, they had passed a decree saying that this massive area of land could be logged and they were going to build a huge road all the way through the jungle um, and, uh, and then open it up. And that was that. And so these, this team of anthropologists and geologists and, and geographers and sort of human sort of rights people got together and uh, they knew that somewhere in there, there was a tribe of untouched Amazonian Indians uh, and they needed to touch them before they came into contact. They needed to sort of meet them and let them know what was going to happen before they came into contact with the people who just bulldozed through their, their territory to create the road. Um, and, and it was an amazing documentary. It happened in 1960 something. And this, uh, there it was, this airplane and it flies over and you could, you could see these little, uh, tiny dots look like ants down in a clearing in the jungle and you could just about make them out as human beings looking up in the sky at this incredible contraption which to them must have been like a ufo really to us and um and they were terrified and they ran away and they moved their camp to another part of the jungle um and so it took them quite a while to track these people down and eventually they tracked them down and they and they got to their village and the village had they'd run away literally minutes before um, the, the, the Brazilian team got there. Um, all of this is on video camera and, and they ran off into the jungle. So the Brazilian team left things like machetes and pots and pans and mirrors and things like this, just left them there for these people, things that might be of use to them. And then they, they walked away and, uh, and the, the people eventually came out of the, the jungle and they reached these things. They realized that the, these tall, pale, strange looking creatures that were you know kind of human looking but very different from anything they'd seen before uh weren't enemies and it's a bit like how how it might be if we you know we came across aliens now you know if aliens landed in the world to us um and lo and behold what happened next was a bit of a disaster 
they made contact um, and then they all got they all started dying of, of a common cold I think because they'd had no contact with um, with with cold flus and viruses and things like this so they all started dying which is horrific and not what was um, anticipated at all um, and so they were rescued um, and and taken to a um, uh, a refuge somewhere and you know in a protected part of the forest um, and it was a really horrific um, ending to to their their tribe really but at the same time um, it was interesting because they then interviewed some of the surviving members of the tribe who were children when this this first contact happened uh, and eventually they went back and resettled an area that was close to where they originally lived um, but they could never go back to to how they were before you know they they now they walk around in loincloths, but they sometimes have a T-shirt on, and sometimes they wear a pair of shorts. And you know, flip-flops are quite handy. And that machete, well, couldn't live without that. You know, their world had changed, and they got a radio system in case anyone gets ill. They can phone, you know, and, and get medical care. And and so their world had changed. They'd had the, the mother of all paradigm shifts, and I think it would be the same as if, you know, in our culture, a bunch of aliens came and. Um, you know, and told us, oh, by the way, you're just, you know, you think you know what you're doing, but you, you really, you're, you're just a very small part of the universe. And there's all this, you know, so that would, that, that's a huge paradigm shift, but they, they happen on a, on a national, perhaps even a universal level. Um, and also on a very personal level as well. And, but I think they're, they're things that I just, I, I just can't get enough of them. And I, I can, I can, if I had more time, I'd tell you about so many more because there are so many and they're, they're mind-blowing some of them um, a lot of them revolve around first contact between different groups of humans because that's you know because humans have, uh, have developed in different parts of the world and they've developed different types of technology and things so for example when uh, when the Spanish first arrived with Christopher Columbus in in the Americas um, some fantastic things came out of that and some horrific things came out of it. A lot of death and destruction and, and bad things. But, um, you know, these cultures there, they, they, they hadn't used, they'd, they'd come up with the wheel, but they didn't use it as a wheel. You know, they, they didn't have carts and they didn't have any sort of animals that they used to sort of drag things around. So they, they had humans doing, using plows. They, they hadn't considered the idea of using it an ox or, or, you know, or even a llama in many, or whatever they may be in a lot of these parts. The llamas were used by the Aztecs, but not by, by most sort of South Americans, uh, sorry, llamas were used by the Incas rather, but the, the Aztecs and the Mayans, they, they didn't use metal. They had no, no knowledge of metal. They had no knowledge of, uh, you know, they didn't use the wheel. They didn't use things that you'd have, you'd have thought would be you know, essential to be able to create a, a modern, you know, society. And uh, what's well, interesting what, about all that is that I bet yeah. there's something that's equivalent that we're not using today. Yeah. That people will look back and think, God, they didn't even know. <laughs> Insert amazing yeah, thing. Absolutely. Yeah, they didn't even know that back then in uh, 2018. Well, just think about it like the internet. Well, you know, we're talking now. I'm currently in Spain, you're in the UK. Yes, okay, we grew up with telephones and things, but you know the internet wasn't around when I was a kid, and we couldn't imagine the internet. It was a concept that was completely unknown, and um, it's there, there's there's actually a funny funny enough there's um there's a YouTube clip somewhere I can't remember what it is where they're discussing the internet on some TV show, and they say I can't remember if they're talking about the World Wide Web or the internet, and they're having a discussion about what it is. And it's something like in 1996 or something like that, 97 maybe. And they're going, what is this internet thing? Oh, I don't know. I'm sure it will never take off. You know, <laughs> it's just a fad that's passing through. You know, it, it, it is mind blowing really how far we've gone. Having mobile phones, um, you know, that are basically computers. I remember when I was a little boy, granted Star Trek is you know, it was old by the time I watched it as a kid. It was from the 60s and I watched it in, in the 80s. Um, but Star Trek was was a big thing. And I remember one of the cool things they had was um, they had a communicator that they could just like press a button on their shirt and they could talk. And, and I think it was 
Spock, who, who used to walk around with like a handheld device. It was a bit like a mobile phone, you know, and he could ask it questions and they could speak to the computer. Um, and they had a, when they talked to, to people, they, they had, they had FaceTime. They could um, talk to someone in another spaceship and their, their face would appear on the screen. And it was like, wow, that's so cool. That would never happen, you know. And I think just about the only thing, apart from obviously all the aliens and uh, interplanetary space travel, but, um, you know, the only really major part of technology which, which hasn't come about yet is the uh, teleportation. Although they do say that, you know, there have been uh, experiments and they have teleported, uh, I don't know what they are, atoms or something, molecules or whatever it may be from one place to the other. I heard but, a theory um, which said that um, you, it wouldn't be you. I don't know how accurate yeah. it is, but it, it would just be a replica of you that has your memories of teleportation. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. It's a clone, isn't it? It's, yeah, you would die and your clone would be there. But would your clone even know? You wouldn't know because your clone would have all your memories. And, yeah. and you know, it all comes down to do we have a soul? Um, have you watched a movie called The Prestige? Yeah. Yeah, well, that, that's an amazing movie that I would recommend to people to watch. And it just kind of reminded me of it um, because there was another guy there who was a, based on a true story. Uh, and he was a, a, a free thinker. And he was another one um, who, who came up with Nikola Tesla. So uh, Tesla was uh, a Serbian and he became an American citizen. And he had these incredible ideas about uh, um, electric currents. And uh, he created um, an incredible number of um, machines and came up with all sorts of concepts. And he died in poverty uh, with most of, his, uh, most of his inventions. I think there was something like 400 or 4,000 different uh, patents. Um, and some of the things were really revolutionary. Um, so the ability to um, use electricity without cables, without wires, um, and he came up with the concept of providing electricity for free to everybody. Um, and unfortunately, uh, that didn't do very well with the companies that were going to pay for it because they, they don't generally like giving away things for free because where's the profit in it? So, so his ideas sort of died pretty much with him. You had to um, somehow be able to put advertising on the electricity, that, then it would work. Yeah, it would have worked then, wouldn't it? Yeah. They was, he was ahead of his time. So he, he, he actually came up with a number of paradigm shifts, really, of which were largely ignored and misunderstood or, or not understood at all by, by a great deal of people. Um, but uh, yeah, a paradigm shift is something that you, you can't see it. It's like when you do a crossword and you can't quite get it. You know, it's... Oh, what's that last word? I can't quite finish the crossword. And then, you know, somebody else comes along and they go, oh, that's, I don't know, green sleeves. And you go, oh, God, of course it is. Why didn't I think of that? And you, you, it suddenly makes sense to you. And that's what a paradigm shift is. It's when your understanding comes from, from one place to another. So if you were blind and then somebody gave you the gift of sight, then your understanding of the world would change radically, you know, and it's, it's that kind of thing. It's, um, and that's why I, I'm so fascinated by it. Um, and you know, why it's so, so interesting. Um, you know, an another one that's quite interesting, just if we've got time is, um, uh, these, this group of Aboriginals, uh, walking around in the middle of Australia in 1950, something, I think. Uh, and suddenly they came across this incredibly long thing. Like, they'd never seen anything like it had no idea what it was. I thought, what is that? And they walked and walked and walked and walked and walked down, down it. And they, they couldn't find the end. So they turned around and they walked and walked and walked the other way. And they couldn't find the end. So they thought, you know what? Let's cross over. So they climbed over the fence, because that's what it was, and walked and walked and walked. And eventually they saw these incredible animals that they'd never seen before. Never had any clue that such animals could exist. And not only that, but they were huge, fat animals that didn't even move very fast. So they got their spear and they killed one and they built a fire and they started roasting it up and it was good eating and it was a cow and it was fine until suddenly this 
weird creature making a funny noise came up uh, and these two very strange looking guys with very pale skin and waving sticks that go bang got out and were very angry so they decided to sort of offer some of these strangers uh, you know some of their meat that they'd got so they offered the, the farmers some of the farmers own cow meat and that didn't go down very well and so um, uh, they all ran away but one of them got caught and this Aboriginal was taken back and tried and said, you know, you, you've been found guilty of uh, cow rustling and so on and so forth, which, of course, he had no idea about. Um, and so they let him off. Um, but he had gone through a paradigm shift of enormous proportions, you know, until that point, him and his tribe were happily wandering around in the desert, just as their ancestors had done for thousands and thousands of years, when all of a sudden he had to come up with a concept that, they weren't alone in the world. There were these other people who lived there with weird um, bangy sticks called guns uh, and laws and fences and cows and courts and big cities and stuff that he couldn't possibly have imagined. And, um, and that, I, I forget his name and I tried to Google him and I couldn't find him because I forgot his name. Uh, and, um, you know, he, he then learnt English and he went back and he became an ambassador for his people. And he became a sort of halfway house, a sort of someone who could help them with a really painful integration of, of you know, forceful integration, really, of their culture um, into the, sort of the modern Australian world, um, the white man's world. And it was a, it's a very painful and difficult history. Uh, but that guy, he went through the most incredible paradigm shift. And, and you know, he became a very important uh, person and he helped his people. Um, there's, there's no way that, you know, they could have done anything to stop this. Um, you know, th they didn't even have a concept that they could own land, for example. So, you know, how, if, if, if people said to them, you know, whose land is that? They'd say, well, it's nobody's land. So the people would go, well, it's mine now. Um, cause they had no concept <laughs> that a human being could own land. So it was a really horrible shift for them from a paradigm shift of, of you know, the trick there. Yeah. But uh, he, he came out, and I, I'm really you know, annoyed that I can't remember his name because you know, he's, he's obviously a real hero for his people in particular. Um, but that was a huge paradigm shift. And I, when I heard that story, I was blown away by it because imagine what went through his mind. you know. Um, so paradigm shifts can be positive and they can be negative. Um, but um, that's for sure. Uh, but, you know... We are here because of them, and science doesn't just gradually evolve. It evolves up to a point, there's a ceiling, and it sort of crashes there, like Alan Turing did with his trying to break the um, Enigma code. It's sort of, you need something, you need some friction, you need something that makes you think in a different way. Um, you know, and as I said before, uh, some of the most important scientists um, of all time had that. So. Uh, Sir Isaac Newton, when he was studying at Cambridge, there was a black death and he couldn't study anymore. So he had to, he, he, instead of learning, he had to sit down and think laterally and come up with his own ideas. And that was when he came up with the theory of um, gravity and all sorts of other things. Um, same with Albert Einstein. He, you know, was a Jew in the, you know, in the German 1930s in the run-up to the Second World War. And he wasn't allowed to go to university. So... You know, I, th I think he was a postman or something. I can't remember what it was. But, um, you know, he wasn't able to learn anymore. And so he took the knowledge that he'd already possessed and he thought laterally and he thought about different things and it just sort of came to him. Um, and he came up with all these theories, the theory of relativity, the E equals MC squared and, and a number of other things. And so, you know, that, that's, that's kind of what it is. It's maybe taking a new bit of knowledge that you didn't even know could exist uh, and, and it just opens your, your world up in a way that until that point seemed impossible. Anyway, I hope that uh, that's been a bit of a paradigm shift and I, I would really very much like the idea of maybe next, next time talking about uh, that book that we talked about, The Richest Man in Babylon, which so inspired me and took me uh, in a different direction in my life. So that, that really was a paradigm shift moment for me too. So yeah, let's do that. All right, buddy. Until next time. Okay. Always a pleasure. Bye.